I've only listened to your show for a short time, but it's my favorite podcast by a long shot. I'm listening in reverse order, which is amusing to say the least. And as a brand new private pilot, the info I'm learning here is causing a penguin ride on my iceberg. I hope I got that reference right. I'm still learning all the podcast lore. <laughs> Ready. This is Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk. Your hosts, Alpha Golf and Romeo Hotel, have a half century of aviation experience in combat helicopters, airliners, and air traffic control. They answer your questions about flying, aviation, and ATC. This weekly podcast is for entertainment and education and does not serve as a replacement for a qualified flight instructor, an examiner, the FARs, the 7110, your best friend, your next pilot, or your cat. November 628 Charlie Delta Squawk 1200, frequency change approved. The audio will be available on live ATC. Good day. November 643 Juliet Mike, clear visual approach from way 23 left, Connect Tower. November 3222 Yankee, area of heavy to extreme precipitation, 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock, 15 miles, 7 miles. Uh, 3047 Charlie, try a departure, radar contact, climb and maintain. November 747 Sierra Lima, reduce speed to 180, you're overtaking traffic ahead on final. Skyhawk 77 Tango, IFR cancellation received, squawk VFR, frequency change approved. Sierra 720 yeah. Fox, yeah. Trent Alpha, yeah. flatting yeah. 190 vectors for the visual Skyhawk approach. Skyhawk Niner Runway, Sierra Papa, clear to enter Triad Class Charlie surface area from the east, maintain special VFR conditions. Please welcome retired Army pilot Alpha Golf and the rookie first officer at Penguin Airlines, Romeo Hotel. It's Monday, January 22nd, 2024, episode 316. On today's show, we'll talk about finding a local aviation community, private pilot progression, and more of your awesome feedback. What's up, baby? Hello, hello, everyone. <laughs> I didn't know what to say there. I think I said it correctly. Yeah. All right, let's go. We're going to just jump right in. Okay. Uh, you put some notes in here. Tell me how home is. I haven't been back there in a while. <laughs> it's freezing cold. Mm. Uh, yesterday, the wind chill was down in the single digits, which is not mm. normal for here. And it's it's really, you know, I, I didn't move to North Carolina for that. No, it's terrible. It's unacceptable. It is. It's unacceptable. <laughs> <laughs> I am nearing the end of my training. Uh -huh. We're almost done. I have lots of audio to put out and lots of things to share, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that today. All right. But for the everyday listener, everything is going swimmingly, and it's a lot of fun, and I have lots to share. So Yeah, that's good. Um, and I'm ready to go home. I'm... I haven't been gone this long ever. This is a long time. Mm -hmm. And I don't have really a good opportunity to go home. If I do go home, I will be able to stay for about 12 hours. I don't feel like that's, that's good enough. That's not very much. <laughs> oh. No. Shall we move on and begin? All right. Let's All move right. on. <laughs> I got to remember what to push Ready. here. Since OB315, we have a ton of new patrons in the show. Listener tier, Echo Bravo, Sierra Bravo, Mike November, and Delta Sierra. Another Delta Sierra in the show supporter tier. And two new Supreme Galactic Aviation Commanders, Juliet Tango and Charlie Whiskey, who came up from the show maker tier. And some PayPalers. Huge drop from Romeo Whiskey. Thank you, everybody. If you'd like to learn more about supporting the show and seeing our pretty hangry faces on the YouTube, check out patreon.com slash opposing basis. If you haven't done so already, leave us a review, hit subscribe or follow on your podcast player. Our episodes will be waiting for you each week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Radios and announcements. And announcements. Oh, my phone is blowing up. Why don't you get the review and I'll check to see if this is some Mayday text. Okay. The review is titled, which I feel like we've had similar ones, but I, I don't know. 
You're but crushing better... it. This new technique of deleting them afterwards is perfect. Yeah, except I, I realized <laughs> a, a potential error in that when I went to go get the one for this show, and that some emails contain three. Yes, I apologize for that. Okay, this is so... what happens. They send me when it happens. It's supposed to send me a single. Oh look, you got a new review. Yeah. Oops. And then at the end of the week, it sends me a summary. Oh. That's what the three are sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I keep those if I never got the single version or don't remember seeing the single version, which I don't think happens all the time. So I'm sorry okay. it's confusing. It's okay. We're g we'll get through it. Okay. I'm sure we've, I'm sure we'll only lose a couple thousand listeners over it. All right, this is titled Problem, A Lot of New Penguins on a Small Iceberg. This is a theme, I think, that has been explored before on, <laughs> on the show. <laughs> yes. As a relatively new pilot and current instrument student, I have gotten so much from the wisdom and good humor of hosts AG and RH using their metaphor of penguin brain cells exiting iceberg gray matter. I think my sadly small and shrinking iceberg <laughs> has been has seen a penguin population explosion from the podcast, great insights from controllers and pilots alike into the plumbing of the NAS. So they have been flushed, <laughs> it seems, <laughs> down the tubes, as it were. It seems that controllers are people, too. Whether a newbie or a grizzled veteran of the skies, you will benefit greatly from listening to this podcast, and you'll have fun while learning Delta Romeo Foxtrot. Excellent. Very nice. Thank you for sharing that. I get the announcements. Mm -hmm. All right. Patron Bravo Mike passed their multi ATP check ride in the King Air 200. A truly handsome airplane. Congrats. <laughs> I feel like somebody who wrote the notes did that little note. Huh. Uh, Possibly. No, I can't. No. It's, I don't hey, know. that's a big deal. Congrats. Yeah, it is. Very good. Uh, and it sounds like you did that in a plane instead of a sim, like what I'm working on right now. I will get my type in a sim. Not in the plane. So good on you. Uh, patron uh, Bravo. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, there was, I was trying to remember if that was the one where their total check ride was like seven and a half hours. What? Yeah. From from beginning of the oral to the end of the flight. Ugh. And so I think, oh, man, I can't remember. Because somebody said, hey, I had this really long check ride. I'd be interested to know what other listeners have experienced in terms of is, you know, what's your longest or worst check ride? I think is what uh, Bravo Mike was mm. asking in this uh, email. And I meant to put it in and somehow I spaced that out. So, Did you have any check rides near seven hours? Uh, not quite that long, but my instrument ride was pretty long. Okay. Like over four and i only flew for an hour mm. maybe so, so like, it the aura was really really grueling mm. terrible mm. terrible questioning <laughs> draw the schematics <laughs> of this instrument yeah i mean just because you surely need that in the middle of the clouds right uh, my longest check ride was probably my CFI, which it was done part 141, which is traditionally shorter than a part 61 check ride. But the syllabus required a four hour ground oral portion. And the flight took a while. It took probably two, 2.5 to get everything done. Cause there's, it's like a commercial check ride, but you got to do everything and teach it. And it's a little bit more tedious to get through all that stuff so yeah uh congrats patron bravo golf past their instrument check ride congratulations uh we've got some messages i guess about some missed acronyms frc is full root clearance we say that a lot and we say it quickly the strip will say that for air traffic it does not appear that way on the pilot side i've seen what that looks like with the pdc and it says route clearance, check route clearance, or something like that. It, it doesn't use an acronym. Uh, right. right. Yeah. So basically, you filed a flight plan. Air traffic changed it. Mm -hmm. You don't know about the change yet. 
and the clearance hasn't been issued. So in case that controller leaves before you get your clearance, they write on the ticket, FRC in red typically, so that the next controller knows they need to read this whole thing. The pilot does, does did not file it this way. Right, so we can't say cleared to XYZ as filed because that would be bad. Yes. <laughs> About five <laughs> minutes down the road. Yep. Because that's not how they were cleared. So uh, CPDLC, we said that very quickly a thousand times. I think you got this right. Controller pilot data link communications. Boom. <laughs> I, I thought that's what it was, and then I looked it up, and that's what it yeah. was. And so then I wrote boom because yeah, I felt right. like, hmm, I nailed it. Yeah. That is a super advanced like late 80s early 90s technology that yeah just, very yeah really just now coming into our airspace <laughs> text messages with airplanes and atc so oh. that's really what it boils down to is text messages and some data yep uh if we did say an acronym and we didn't s- pause to explain it let us know thank you delta whiskey for the reminders uh, we do not have a Charlie Alpha segment this week. I will say this real quick, though, uh, because the review reminded me of this about penguins and icebergs. And there was one point this week where I'm not sure I could have told you anything about rules and air traffic. I was really? consumed. Your, your brain was completely covered up. Completely consumed with what I'm doing now. Mm. Now, if I kind of partition the hard drive and go back to that like when we do the show every week i can i can get back into that mode but in the middle of these sims this week there is no way i could have explained a lot with air Mm. traffic i would have been lost for words Mm. ask ag i don't know (laughs) i just don't know (laughs) someone asked me today i was at a restaurant and he knows i'm in training hey do you guys fly every plane or is it just one at a time and I said, well, that's a good question. No, we, we just fly a, a single type of airplane. Uh, that's, that's how it is everywhere. That's a commercial carrier. And I, and I thought about it for a second. I said, it's, it's a, it, I could see if you had, like in our fleet, it's a very similar frame and similar system logic, but it would be a hot mess to try to remember two planes at once. And for the guys in the corporate world that are doing that, good on you. I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you keep things straight because just the, uh, just the memory items alone to get you out of trouble. If you mess those up now, there might be some similarity between fleets. That's possible, but I don't know, man, I know people who've come to this fleet and left this fleet and gone to other fleets and they have to brain dump it. It has to go away. You can't think about that anymore. What, when you went from the Chinook to the King air, did you feel like you did that where you had oh, to yeah. kind of, Yep. <laughs> yep. I could. I barely could remember anything about limits and EPs. Oh no! From the Chinook, I'd have to go through all that again. But if I, if you just miraculously were presented with your airborne fly this helicopter, you would, you could do that. Oh yeah. Until something goes wrong, and it's gonna, it's gonna take a minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll handle the flying part. You do all the checklist stuff. I don't remember. I think the ones that were are like you got to do something right now, or it could be bad. I think mm-hmm. I would probably those are like ingrained in my head forever okay. and ever. Okay, that's uh, fair. But there's only a couple. There's only a few. Sure. We so. don't even have memory items for immediate action items for an engine failure. There's no urgency. Right. Fly the plane. Yes. Fly the plane. There's yep. nothing that you can do quickly that isn't gonna that will help you. You take your time. The plane can fly with one engine yep, and, and get to the checklist after you get the airplane under control because this airplane's a handful with one engine <laughs> stopped. Yeah. There, yeah. Uh, for us, you're on fire. You're about to be on fire because the transmission's hot. Mm-hmm. Dual engine failure. Mm-hmm. That's nice. super rare. Super, mm-hmm. super rare. Mm-hmm. But you got to do. You need to reduce the thrust immediately. Okay. Or you're going to kill the rotor RPM, and you won't get it back. <laughs> and then you're a brick <laughs> with pretty little twirly. 
flowers on the top. I thought helicopters could float for a minute. And they can if the wing's still spinning. Yeah, it has to be spinning. <laughs> yep. <laughs> we did a double engine flutter this week. Mm. Um, benign. It was. They didn't even give us the reason why it happened. It could happen for a number of reasons. Uh, most likely some sort of heavy precipitation that flamed them about the flamed both of them out mm -hmm. and it's restarting them which is actually very simple compared to what you would think it's not hard to get them moving again mm. provided they're not damaged right so provide ignition keep the thing spinning is important you need a certain airspeed and you know recycle the fuel going in and out of it but eventually it'll start back up provided you have gas if you ran out, of, if your engine stopped because you ran out of gas, then yeah, you're st you can't restart it. <laughs> nope, nope, you don't make gas. You There's no backup noise. tank. That's it. <laughs> you burned it all, dumb dumb. Right. <laughs> we <laughs> we were doing dust landing training, and the helicopter was filthy. So when we got back, before we shut down, we drove by. We drove. We taxied by uh, <laughs> this. Uh, if it's basically like a fire truck. Okay. Right? And so they sprayed us down with a fire hose. Well, the guy spraying us down left the thing pointed straight into the engine. And I'm talking a stream of water, like <laughs> five or six inches around, <laughs> blasting into the engine. You, th I would have thought it would have flamed it out. Uh-uh. Nope. The, something mm -hmm. in the FADEC said, hey, we need more gas. <laughs> <laughs> something ain't right. And it just spray the the temperature went like it just shot through the roof instantly because mm -hmm. it started dumping gas in there like crazy so we i just reached up and snatched it offline real quick but man it will take a lot of water it will drink a lot of water the giant steamer <laughs> yeah <laughs> that was crazy cool uh, i'm glad i got to share that that was our little mini charlie alpha segment how about that very good all right moving on moving on Timely feedback. Timely feedback. Why don't you get one? Well, I can get one. And when you get two, I'll go find this audio. I did not do that before. Um, so at some point before we get to the audio, I have to go get it and put it on the soundboard. <laughs> so, oh, okay. Wait. Uh, I think you put one at the top. Oh, the audio. Oh, it comes yep. yeah, in feedback later. I did not get that yet. So okay. I'll get number one. Something is messed up. Hmm. Oh, no. Disregard. All right. Number Forget one from SCAC patron Juliet Alpha Sierra. Howdy. In listening to OB315, I began to wonder how long the training for a col controller can last before they become certified. Forever is the answer. Forever. It can go on and on and I, on. I, I asked in the context of a flight last week when I got into a weird three-way conversation with air traffic. I was departing from Margaritaville Lake Airport on runway heading, and immediately after getting switched to departure, I got an instruction to turn 20 degrees right, no explanation, such as for traffic, and to climb to 2,500 feet. About five minutes later, the same controller told me to turn 20 more degrees to the right, which I repeated back and then started to perform. Another voice immediately came on the radio, seemingly from much farther away based on the quality of the voice signal telling me to maintain present heading and to climb and maintain 3,500. I repeated that back and started my climb. All subsequent instructions came from the first controller. Now the first controller's voice is the one I recognize going back several years from when I started my instrument training. He is one of two controllers I think of as the happy twins. <laughs> In the Clutch City departure arrivals air traffic, there is one man and one woman who are noticeably fantastic. Just one? Okay. Hmm. Great cadence and pace, very clear, and always very, very cheerful. So I knew who I was talking to in this case. I would normally assume that the second voice was a trainer correcting something, but I've been hearing the same person for more than two years. So a couple questions. I don't recall you ever touching on how long someone is in training status. So is it possible that this person would still be a trainee after more than two years? Yes, mm -hmm. that is a, a, totally likely. If not, under what circumstances and who, if not a trainer, would be listening? 
in and intervening in the providing of instructions to a pilot. That should be the only one. There's That's some it. people there. The only time you, you might hear a supervisor actually chime in. Uh, it might be a security thing I can't talk about, but very unlikely. And in your case, <laughs> this sounds like the trainer. The supervisors plug in time to time. Yes, but it's to, uh, to it is to listen. Yeah, they're not. They should not be. No. Keen up unless it was during a check ride. <laughs> it's possible. The and if that will... supervisor giving the check ride had to key up and say something, that check ride <laughs> is over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Things are going south. <laughs> it's bad. Very bad. Could it have been center or another sector? Who gets to jump in and change an instruction from a controller if the controller isn't? Nobody. Isn't nobody. a trainee. That's not, not a thing. Nobody. We can all talk on every frequency in the building from every position. But that would lead to massive confusion. Oh, my gosh. It does lead to massive confusion when we decombine positions and yes. the person <laughs> leaves their frequencies on. It's a busy signal in your ear. Right. And the pilots, yeah. Uh, it's a mess. Um, a mess. The only other possibility on this is that they keyed up and the person wasn't plugged in with them. It was right next to them in some sort of conflicting airspace. And maybe that's why the quality was down. Because you can hear background noise in the room. Sure. That's what, that is possible. You heard them saying something th through that person's mic. Mm-hmm. I mean, Another? as far as far as an explanation of how this person could be in training this long, you've got multiple sectors, you know, you might hear them on a sector that they're certified on all the time. Mm -hmm. And this is the last position they're trying to, you know, two years. Mm -hmm. That's completely conceivable. I, yeah, that's not a long time. Yeah, that's not. So great question. Thanks, Sierra Golf. SGAC, Patriot Juliet Alpha Sierra. Thank you. Thank you for supporting the show. Good question. Yes, training took us forever, and that's for a million reasons. Most of the time has nothing to do with the trainee and everything to do with the fact that when you get a position, I'm biting my tongue. Watch me go into PC mode here. Why? You're <laughs> not in the FAA. <laughs> when you have certified on one of, say, 10 positions in a building, you're useful on that position, and that will over you know you get two positions three positions four now you're spent time staffing versus always training so the more positions you have the likelihood of you becoming staffing increases hmm. i said that as nicely as i could that is <laughs> that is true <laughs> do you want number two number two from patron alpha mike hey guys Two items I wanted to address coming out of OB 315. In reaction to Micromio Lima's questions about wireless headsets, am I the only one who only one who imagined the horrors of sore, some poor controller going to use the restroom with their <laughs> headset still on and a stuck mic? Okay, that would be terrible. But first of all, if you leave the control room with your headset on, you are a super nerd, right? Yeah. Super nerd. You need to take it off. <laughs> it's just a public service announcement. Don't be walking around in the building with your headset on, right? No. Mm -mm. So hopefully that doesn't, that's not happening. Uh, well, granted, we have mute buttons. Instead of push to talk, I can't count the number of times on work conference calls. Someone has shared the dulcet tones of their toilets flushing <laughs> or worse. <laughs> Oh, dear. Uh, that happened when I was in grade school. I think it was in fifth grade. Hmm. T did your teachers... We went through this thing where... Uh, this period of time where they were getting microphones and they installed wireless mic speakers in the room. We never had those. Yep. Someone took one to the restroom. Yep. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was probably the talk of the town. For fifth graders, it was oh, just yeah. absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Love it. All right. Uh, continuing on. Number two, November Bravo asked a question about emergency aircraft, which got me thinking, is there more than the text of Chapter 10 in the 7110 that directs controllers on how to respond to emergency aircraft? 
or is that pretty open to control or discretion? I originally got to thinking about it this past fall when I had to clear an emergency for reduced thrust after takeoff at a class Delta airport. I was a little surprised to hear Tower telling an aircraft to expedite their takeoff on a crossing runway as I was on short final. I'm not suggesting anything was wrong with that, but I guess but I guess I kind of always thought ops would be paused with an emergency aircraft whose landing was imminent. As always, I appreciate you both and all you do to help us be safe out there. Alpha Mike. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. Is there something other than the thing in Chapter 10? Yeah, kind of. There's a little blurb in the beginning that says, if there's something not covered in this book, it's the controller needs to you know, use their best discretion. I don't remember exactly how it's worded, but... It's kind of a, f- a freebie. Yeah, know. it's kind of, kind of a catch-all. Yeah. Okay, don't be so robotic, RH, that you only rely on the vocabulary and the examples we give you. You have to think and, and it, yep. be creative sometimes. Um, as far as other traffic during an emergency, it just totally depends. Um, if they think that they can... You know, me personally, if I think I can get somebody out or to part somebody on a crossing runway without really a problem, I, I, I don't think I would be willing to expedite if it's that close. I'm mm-hmm. probably going to wait. That's, but hey, I mean, if you can get them out, it's not going to be a problem. Just yeah, go ahead. There's nothing that says you have to stop all traffic. I guess put it that way. Unless we have an alert three, which shuts the field down. Right. And that is frustrating, too, from a controller perspective. You have a cat, uh, an alert three, because somebody's coming in with, I don't know, a fire. Let's we'll just say that. Technically, it shuts the runway down, right? Or is it, don't wait, hold on. Am I thinking of no. alert two? Yeah, that's alert two. Alert okay. three is someone has crashed. They ran off the runway, you know. Right. They banged up the plane, and they shut the airport down, the whole right. thing. Which Even is, if you have other surfaces that are totally safe to operate on. Yeah, a mile away. Our other runway is a mile. Mm-hmm. Give me a break. It's like another airport over there. We've said this before. That's usually because the airport is certified with the number of emergency vehicles available. And when they go report to a scene, that airport no longer has those services for the next airplane. Yep. So just something to consider. But once that winds down, so I understand that at the beginning, but they'll keep the airport shut down forever. For ever. Yeah. Like there'll be one truck left, like the the head honcho, Chief 100. Right. Hey, you got to stop this thing. We need to keep moving here. Right. Everybody's fine. Uh, thank you, Alpha Mike. Do I get number three? Yes. New. This is from November Bravo. New listener here. Thanks to my friend Kilo Oscar for recommending your podcast. In episode 314, you discussed canceling IFR going into a non-towered airport and how we lose a margin of safety after that point. You talked about a wild idea of having a VFR flight plan activated in addition to the IFR flight plan. I don't think that's exactly how I said it. Maybe it is. No, it is. For It was an answer to a specific question. The pilot wanted to they in canada i believe when they cancel ifr they're still afforded search and rescue margin of safety from cancellation to the ground somehow with the way they handle that flight whereas in the u.s if when you cancel ifr airborne to a non-towered airport that from that point until the landing no one's looking for you anymore you are on your own there's no method of us to track you. There's no requirement to. We may see your tag not make it to the airport, but that's because we lose radar coverage low to the ground. So the, the solution that I offered, which I did get some text feedback on, this is insanity. No one's going to do this. It's <laughs> tr- right. Right. No one's going to do this. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, man. But if you really wanted to, you could have a VFR flight plan that you activate on your flight EFB, do your IFR like normal, and when you land, you have to close that VFR flight plan somehow, because if you don't, they're going to look for you, which is what you wanted. That was the solution they were looking for. Right. Hmm. I thought you were going to say something. Okay. Well, I... Yeah. Yeah. So in Canada, they, they cancel, and then the controllers still wait for them to call on the ground. 
which we totally could do here. We could. We absolutely could. Um, if, if they verbalize just, that, hey, right. I want to free up this airport so you can let somebody else go. But if I don't call you in 10 minutes, something's wrong. Right. That's possible. All right. While flying an ATP friend, he suggests that, that after canceling IFR and being instructed to squawk 1200, that I make it a habit to keep my prior squawk code in the transponder until after landing. He said this way ATC still knows who you are on their scope. So a couple of questions for you. Is this legal? Does it help provide some additional safety between IFR cancellation and landing? Thank you. November Bravo. Uh, We are combining two separate things here. We can still see you, but as soon as we say IFR cancellation received, boop, boop, you are removed from our list of items, the things we have to worry about. You're done. Yep. And even if you... Are you supposed to stay on that code? No, unless they specifically say to, which is a whole different ball of wax. That usually has to do with boundaries and getting count for that traffic. If you're from Duke side, for example, going to Coat Factory, if you don't make it into our airspace, we don't get credit for talking to you and saying hello and goodbye. If you don't squawk the code in the confines of our airspace, someone's going to send us an email and say, well, that's not true. There's a boundary. Okay. Fine, maybe there is a boundary, but we don't know where it is, so we tell them to stay on that code. Right. But you're still gone. There's no extra safety there. No. And knowing who you are isn't going to help me because I'm not responsible for separating from you anymore. Yeah. In fact, if I told you to squawk 1200 and you didn't, (laughs) and it wasn't in one of these scenarios, I may go and terminate your tag. Yes. And say, what? I don't. I told this guy to squawk VFR because a V tag is way smaller and takes up less space Mm -hmm, than mm -hmm. a full blown data tag. So I might terminate that tag Mm -hmm. and make it go away. Good question though. Yeah. You want number four? Did you take care of your, um, uh, no, because I can't find it. I'm, I'm connected to the internet. I don't know that it's in Dropbox. Perhaps it's not in there. Uh, I think we have a little bit of time to get to that. Let me see. All right. I'll do number four while you see it. It is in Dropbox. Oh. Hmm. I see it just there. Huh. Uh, But why don't... You know Hmm. what? What's it called? Wait, I'll look at the title. Go ahead. You get number four. It might might be a sorting issue on my side. Okay. Number four from patron Tango Foxtrot who has been a patron since July of 2019, one of Mm. our longer standing members. So thank you. Uh, Patron Tango Fox right here. Yeah, the perpendicular guy. I (laughs) don't really know exactly sure that I remember what that is about. Uh, Since we're writing new FARs, (laughs) here's one. 93.2323. Any pilot or controller who realizes or is informed that they are engaged in an argument on an ATC frequency must immediately terminate argumentation. And as soon as practicable, note the altimeter setting in inches of mercury, convert it to dollars, and remit (laughs) that amount per transmission. (laughs) Per transmission to Penguin Aviation Services, care of the mythical triad, should the argument participant have made more than three transmissions as part of the argument argument convert the altimeter to millibars before conversion to dollars <laughs> dang i'm assuming that as with other fa fines the fine must be paid in either unmarked bills or gold ingots but that kind of fact checking is the kind of essential service to the aviation community that the fine folks at penguin aviation services routinely provide tango foxtrot i love that I love this kind of feedback. Change it up every once in a while. Mm-hmm. I I approve of this new FAR. All right. Very good. Moving on. Moving on. I'm all checked up here. Oh, boy. Fancy jet music. I can't find that file, by the way. Okay. You want me to... What, how, what, what would be the best method for me to, to mm. deliver it to you? Um... I will work on that while you do the show topic. How about that? All right. Start reading. I will start reading. Here, I'm going to try this and see what happens. 
just going to text it to you right now so. and I will start reading. Okay. All right. This is, oh, I think I figured it out. This week's show topic is brought to you by patron Sierra Charlie Sierra. Dear RHNAG, hello from directly under the Buckeye Charlie. I often get distracted during work watching departures out my office window. Cool. That's nice. Mm -hmm. uh, I've all I've only listened to your show for a short time, but it's my favorite podcast by a long shot. I'm listening in reverse order, which is amusing to say the least. And as a brand new private pilot, the info I'm learning here is causing a penguin ride on my iceberg. I hope I got that reference right. I'm still learning all the podcast lore. <laughs> All right, let's do a refresh. Should we? Do we it's need time? A, do okay, it. we we need a refresh on the penguin analogy. It's, it's time metaphor, or whatever it is. All right, uh, your brain is an iceberg. That isn't a that isn't commentary on the the temperature of your brain, the coldness. <laughs> it's just <laughs> just bear with me here. All right, your brain is an iceberg. Uh, it is occupied by penguins, which represent knowledge, information, things that you store in your brain are penguins. When you learn new things, new penguins come onto the iceberg. There isn't room. Old penguins get kicked off. They get booted out into the water. They have to go find somewhere else or just float about in the ocean until you need to bring them back, at which point some other thing will get... <laughs> booted off of the iceberg you don't always have control over what gets what gets kicked off into the water so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's basically that's the gist of it right i like it okay. very good uh they continue i'm the only pilot in my family and while they are wonderful sports and listening to my to me gush about density <laughs> altitude and how the earth seventy five thousand types of fog form <laughs> I didn't know there were that many. I'm always on the lookout for other aviation fans. Finding said enthusiasts has been a challenge, and even though I'm a renter at a local airport, there doesn't seem to be a good community there that I could join. Since you are both pilots, I figured I'd ask your advice. Number one, do you have recommendations for finding such a community, or is it just something that takes time and persistence? All right, we're, you're going to get two sides of this because... And RH is probably going to be the better answer. Okay. I was thrust into a community without. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is just it. You're, this is your community. Welcome to it. You like it or don't, but this is where you are. And uh, so, yeah, I didn't get a lot of choice in it. Um, on the civilian side, I. I'm not a good person to ask. Uh, I have a couple ideas. Even All if you right. don't fly one, um, and two specific aircraft type are coming to mind, Cirrus and Bonanza, even if you don't fly one of those two types of airplanes, you can typically find a community of pilots for the plane that you've got your private on. It may be a Cherokee. It may be a Mooney. Who knows? Whatever. Did they say what it was in here? I don't think they did. Uh -uh. Brand new private pilot. You can join one of those groups. And they have events all over the place. You can find a local aviation club, which I'm lucky to have near me. Um, our flying club is where I rent my airplanes, which I haven't done in a while. Um, but we have monthly events, even weekly maintenance stuff. There's a way to get involved in that. You may have to go outside the local area and take a flight somewhere, but it's a good excuse to go fly somewhere too. So you can find a type club. You can usually find some sort of airport club and online man if if you weren't looking for actual face-to-face -face contact there's all sorts of online communities for specifics you know private pilots uh, instrument rating if that's not on the table right now which is part of your the rest of your feedback um but that doesn't mean you can't join one of those groups you don't have sure. to have a type of airplane to be in be in that club that's true so and you're in a community now. Yes. You've joined the OB community. Mm-hmm. So welcome. Many of them are in the chat room right now they going, are. hey, we're over here. Come yep. talk to us. Yep. And I am certain that somebody that's listening 
under the Buckeye Charlie also Mm -hmm. would be more than willing to have community there as well. Yeah, find fly-ins to go to. You're going to meet people. Um, Sometimes the winter's a challenge for that, but as the spring hits, you might... It's a great excuse to go somewhere. Find a fly-in. Uh, Sun and Fun is a big one. I know that's a long way away, but you're very close to Air Venture. You want to talk about aviation community? Go tell your family you're leaving for a week and go hang out with a bunch of other pilots. You're going to meet people that you'll know for your lifetime. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Oh. Absolutely. Man, think of all the people we've met at Osh. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Number two, I don't have the funds to get my instrument rating right now. Alas, listening to your show makes me want to do it so badly, but want to gain experience any way I can. I've been floundering a bit since finishing private training, and I'd love some advice on goal setting. What would you recommend? Despite having listened to you guys for about 25 hours now, I'm still a little scared of ATC. Maybe I should fly to more towered airports to get over my irrational fear. Yes. Yep, you have to do it. The more you do it, the easier it will become. The more you listen to the show and pick up little tidbits, uh, the better it will be. So, yes. Um, I would recommend on um, gaining experience, especially with air traffic, is go out of your uh, radio dialogue comfort zone i guess Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. go somewhere you've never been go somewhere that you have to talk to someone get flight following every time you fly all the time yep and one that engages you with the controller it forces you to have a conversation two it's your you're listening to what's happening Mm -hmm. all the time you're going to pick up little things and what it forces you to do is focus you know to listen for your call sign in doing that, you're going to hear all of the other conversations that are happening. It exposes you to, um, you know, just all of the other. It gives you some essay on some mm-hmm. situational awareness on on what's going on. It's all. It's only going to help. It's only going to help. I think a way to uh, quantify that for goal setting. You're asking about goal setting advice. Hey, I'm going to fly. I'm going to make sure I get in this airplane two times a month or three times a month. And every time I get in the plane, I'm going to go somewhere different. I'm going to look at the weather, find the best place for me to go, provided it's VFR where you are, obviously, because everything kind of has to go back to the middle of the wheel, right? But go to a new place every time and pick towered airports. You, There's tons of airports in your state. Oh, you don't yeah. have to go to another state, but instead of going back to the same place over and over again, because that'll become your comfort zone, and it'll take you, and we're going to talk about this at the end of the show, I think, in yep. one of the feedbacks, that will become your little bubble, and you won't get any f- more confidence. You put it on paper. Hey, I want to go to, this year, I want to go to 10 different airports. Go. I've already been to this one twice. Go to the next one. You're going to learn a lot. Absolutely. I kind of wanted this feedback to be something that the whole OB uh community kind of chimed in on what have you guys done uh to help you know gain experience to help with talking to air traffic you know you guys send in recommendations because you're the ones that are really out there doing it yeah uh more than we are so Mm -hmm. um let us know and we'll kind of talk about that for the next few weeks maybe i love this next question Number three, is it normal to be nervous when taking passengers up? Even when I've done all my planning and even when the trip is short, I still feel like I'm doing something wrong or have missed something important. Does it just take more time and experience to feel confident? Uh, Yes. So one of my first flights as a pilot in command, or if not the first one, was... Back in the day, we had things, uh, a thing called Family Day, and we would give rides on the Chinook to family members. Now, you were never allowed to take your own family members on a flight, but you took a whole plane full of other people's family members. All right. One of those people 
was the general's wife. Mm, that's not anything to be worried about. As we were walking out to the helicopter, the general approached me. He said, I understand this is your first flight as a PC. I said, yep. He goes, congratulations. That's a big deal. Don't kill my wife. <laughs> Roger that, sir. So, yes, it is normal to feel nervous. I was super nervous. Mm -hmm. um, but that's good. That's a good sign. If you weren't, if you were just completely overconfident, that would mm -hmm. I would be more concerned about that. Yeah, um, you, sh you should be taking extra time to think things through. You're doing what all good pilots do. You're thinking through it all because you don't have the comfort of an instructor next to you. Next to you, and when something goes wrong, if it does, completely out of your control, you want to be able to deal with it, and you want to be able to continue to fly with those family members or friends. You want to bring them in, not scare them out of it. So. That's normal. Yeah, that's totally normal. Uh, I we took our family in the Skyhawk back several years ago, and I had just been rechecked out in that plane. I wasn't nervous, but I was definitely more aware of things that if I was just going solo, I wouldn't have been worried about. But was it turbulent? Was it super windy? Was there anything on the plane that looked out of place that might make them worried? You have to think about your passengers. You're you're right. they're relying on you, so. I think those feelings are totally normal. And as you get more experience going outside the confines of 30 or 40 miles from your home field, you're going to feel more confident putting people on the plane too. So, Yep. Great questions. Mm -hmm. uh, they continue. Anyway, thanks for all you do. And I tell people about your show all the time. Keep up the excellent work. Sincerely, patron Sierra, Charlie, Sierra. P.S. Mm -hmm. Please restock the OB Penguin t-shirt soon. We're gonna do a spring line. We're gonna have, we're yep. gonna have spring shirts, new shirts, shirts, new hats. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yes. I haven't ordered the hats yet. Let's. Um, I would love to have some feedback on what kind of hats people would want. Mm. Currently, currently, I um, am looking at just a kind of standard, low profile, not a huge like box thing above your head but like a low profile trucker hat with mm -hmm. an ob logo laser etched on mm -hmm. leather in on the front the Pretty ones simple. we have me and you have them yes yep, yeah they're those. very nice yep i think those would be a huge hit i think they would too um i know a lot of people in aviation though like these you know floppy unstructured hats for flying so anyway uh, one final thing on this, I I have spent very little time alone in an airplane. Most of my flying is with another person, sometimes another pilot. Bring somebody with you. Yeah. Flying by yourself, I know there's people who do it all the time. There's nothing wrong with it. But aviation is fun. And if you're recreational flying and you're going places, bring someone with you. And maybe someone who's super close to you and trusts you and you could build your confidence with that person as you as you move through the 25 hours is not a lot of time. You you are very very new to flying. So, dip your toe in there, find somebody that who wants to go flying and take them somewhere. Even if it's close, just go somewhere. I think aviation should be enjoyed by multiple people on the airplane. So, I found 25 the hours is the amount of time this person has listened to us. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't know how much time they have total. Okay. Well, you're you're new. You've pointed that out. Right. And if you don't if you don't stay engaged, back to your first point. If you don't stay engaged and find ways to challenge yourself by you know, it's easy to cancel a flight. Oh, it's a little bit windy or uh eh, I just I don't want to drive all the way down there. Find put it on paper. These are my goals. I'm going to get in the plane this many times per month. I think I've said before at least once a month. If you can fly yeah. once a month, you're you're going to feel a little bit rusty every time, but twice a month is probably better. So, I agree. Great question. I love that show topic. Cool. Moving on. Moving on. Feedback time. Feedback. I found the audio from <laughs> patron... 
Alpha Delta sent audio feedback. Let me know when you're ready to hit play. I am ready. One, two, three, boop. Guys, patron Alpha Delta from East of the Triad. I just looked at the docket the NTSB published of their uh, investigation of the Austin FedEx Southwest uh, close call. There's no discussion really of whether the um, Southwest plane should have been cleared into or to take off with the FedEx plane on what was a couple mile final. Um, I thought from one of your recent transmissions or, or, or sessions that that was discussed, that you shouldn't be past the IFR hold line uh, if there's any plane that's inbound inside of the final approach fix. So is that a local rule um, or would that occur at all um, airports? Because I was surprised it was never uh, discussed in, in, in this these preliminary reports in the docket. Thank you. Ooh, great question. That is an element of that we have not discussed. Mm-hmm. Uh, want me to take a stab at this? Yeah, go for it. So our runway that's on the north side of the airport, the critical area for the ILS is in the grass on a non-movement area. It's just a road for vehicles. There's A plane can't be in that critical area. Uh, the localizer critical area at the far end of the runway is ignored for rolling traffic. It's intermittent in terms of you're flying through it for such a short time that uh, we can't taxi somebody across. We're not supposed to. Do I yep. have that right? Yes. Yep. Uh, but we can launch, and the rules allow us to launch an airplane. Not talking about the separation issue with that uh, specific incident you brought up, but when that airplane was cleared, it's uh, very likely that the critical area for the glide slope was on the other side of that runway, and that aircraft did not go through it. So it, yep. was, it wasn't part of the equation. Right. I agree. I, I, that's the same thing I thought. Um because otherwise, you you probably wouldn't. For mm-hmm. us, uh, for runway two three left, it's the other way. So the, mm-hmm. the the critical area is on the taxi side of the runway, uh, or from the, I guess the terminal side. And once somebody's inside the final approach fix, I can't send anybody out there. Mm-hmm. They've got to be on the runway rolling before that plane gets inside the final approach fix. So. My guess is what you're saying. It's on the other side in this case. Um, and I'll briefly explain this because I think it's been a long time since we talk about it. I'll do it as quickly as possible. The critical area is most of the time we're talking about it. It's in reference to the glide path, which is sending out a signal from a building that is very close to the arrival end of the runway. And if you put an airplane on a taxiway that blocks that signal, the aircraft on final inside the final approach fix that signal would be blocked and could cause them an unnecessary at that point go around because they may get a flag on their glide slope. Boop. It's no longer reliable. That's an automatic go around. So we don't put anybody there. Is it, uh, would it be okay if you taxi them through there real quick? Probably, but that's not what the rules allow us to do. Right. And you have to have them, like you said, moving down the runway by the critical area. So you don't have, we, we slow everything down at that point. Right. It's for the for the guys that are working at airports with departure and arrival separate surfaces, they don't have to deal with this. Uh for triad, it's a everyday thing. You stop short of the critical area and you wait till the airplane gets off the runway. That's it. Right. Right. So mm-hmm. just as a reminder, we're protecting that when the ceilings are less than eight hundred and the visibility is less than two miles. Which is silly because the blocking of the signal can still happen if the air, if the weather was just a little bit better than that. Yeah. So now you have to be a pretty big airplane to actually block that, right? Yeah. It's far enough away and sending a three degree glide path up that most planes are going to be underneath that, but the yeah. possibility still exists. In the movie, <laughs> what is that Christmas movie? Die oh, Hard. I just watched number two <laughs> the other day. Uh-huh. They talk about changing the glide slope angle. Yeah, and they like lower it so they like arrive on a two mile final into which dirt. is not what would happen. <laughs> you would actually have to move the glide slope shack out there to a yeah, two mile final for the if aircraft. If I remember to do. right, the computer scene is it just shows them like, boop boop boop. <laughs> it moves this whole path down. Yep. None <laughs> of those graphics or things exist in a real. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> no. <laughs> and I love how all the radar controllers work up in the tower. Yep. Right. Yeah. Cool. You get number two? Number two from SCAC patron Juliet Sierra. I worked hard to catch up on all the past episodes after I found OB in 2021, but I also listen to various back episodes of OB whenever I'm driving to an airport uh, to fly to get me in the right frame of mind, and it is incredibly helpful. But this weekend, while looking for an episode uh, to repeat, I realized I had somehow missed 219. Mm, 219. Uh, what a gem. Uh, one of our I, best. Uh, I know it was... <laughs> somewhat of a joke to suggest that pirates are somewhat of a goof when pilots are just confirming what is already being reported but in the general vicinity of the cj stroud bravo i have found them to be incredibly helpful maybe it is the gulf coast and its effect on weather but conditions can be wildly different within 10 to 20 minutes of an airport uh, reporting weather for example i was flying into the why the heck does this lake have a margaritaville resort airport and the airport was reporting uh, clear and visibility unlimited. Uh, what is that? I think that's what they meant. Okay. But the pirates were reporting intentional fires and smoke. Intentional fires? Yeah. I feel I like that know. was a typo. Yeah, okay. So fires and smoke that were obscuring the airport in a way that visuals were useless, and the visual was being advertised. Mm. I was able to plan um, a way out rather than scrambling to figure it out uh, once I got close. I know you aren't suggesting pirates are useless and are really discussing the effort to record a pilot confirming that the conditions are as expected over and over as frustrating, but at least in my small part of the world where the Cowboys are an awful football team and the Houston Texans are great there are many <laughs> there are many fire ups that are incredibly useful i get frustrated too with fire ups that parrot conditions in the same way some notums just repeat the same useless things that have nothing to do with your flight there are trees there are birds the moon influences tides lightning is not caused by clouds bumping together cats and dogs are living together that's <laughs> hysteria but there are definitely parts of the country where the remarkably variable conditions warrant these. And to be fair, a pilot confirming what a model or a forecaster anticipates can also be useful. Again, I know you aren't actually suggesting the opposite, but I thought it worth saying, Julius here. Okay, let's just reiterate our position on pyreps <clears throat> as we see them. Are there important and useful pyreps? Yes, absolutely. There are ones that are really important. Are those just providing a basis report once an hour, every hour, no matter what? Is that is that somehow satisfying the importance of pyreps? No, it mm. is not. It's just bureaucracy. It's, and mm, I'm biting my tongue. And the triplicate okay, I got a PIREP, I filled it out, then I filled out a form that said I got a PIREP, then I filled it out online and I put it in the system. Then I told 14 people, I texted my dad and said, hey, just got a PIREP for the hour. It's just ridiculous. That's the part controllers can't stand. And it's so dumb. Yeah. Yeah, we uh, have lost sight of the picture on the air traffic side on the importance of valuable pyreps. Are all of them valuable? Sure, if you understand the context. Right. But repeating the things over and over again, oh, I, I won't do it. I won't go off on a rant. You did it yeah. for me in a very nice way. Okay. So. Uh, let's see. What else? Okay, so. The, the, the one thing you added in there that we haven't ever, I don't think we've ever said, because it's true. Validating a forecast from a uh, someone in a, in a weather office, that is important. Uh, so some of those benign forecasts you, or uh, pyreps you hear, you know, we're at 5,000 feet, it's smooth, the temperature this, temperature that. Well, if there was no weather balloon launch, that it, that is helpful information for somebody. Yeah. Um, I typically, in our airspace, like to concentrate on icing that was in the confines of our airspace because GA can't typically get away from that. Right. And that's important. That can kill them. It right. can literally kill them. 
So I am high alert. Where's the icing? All right. If you go above this altitude, it's bad. All right. Well, then I'm going to keep you below this altitude. I'm going to tell you why. Right. That's our. That's a great pie rep. Yes. Where is bad turbulence? How do how do we stay out of that? Where does it start? Where does it stop? That those kind of things. Yes. And those are the kind of things where you writing it down and putting it on a form, which is put on another form, and then is put in the system, is in real time is helping no one. Mm-mm. A pilot might look at that you know, later, go look at pirates and say, okay, I don't want to fly at 5,000 or 6,000. But in real time, I, the thing that's helpful is for me, the, the, the sort of clearinghouse for all this information is to then distribute it to people that are in the air right now flying. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Not writing it down uh. and putting it on 16 forms. Uh, very, it was very good. We handled that very well, I think. Okay. <laughs> we should pat ourselves on the back. Okay. Do I get number three? Yes. From patron Juliet Delta. Hi, gents. After listening to OB308, I decided to write in to share a practice I've adopted that may be helpful to your listeners. Thank you. Thank you. I typically fly IFR. My airport recently lost radar. We we now have a new tower. Sweet. So Thanks. I... I am handed off from approach to my tower at the five mile mark, which leaves very little time to build situational awareness. I love how you use that acronym SA of the landing runway, airborne pattern, aircraft landing and departure queue, etc. Okay. On com two, after getting the weather, I flip my standby frequency from 121.5, which is guard Bravo for listening to that. That's the first place controllers go when you go off into frequency land. Yep. I love it. This is a great feedback. Uh, when I get shipped to the tower, I go from 125. Oh, okay. You're changing COM2 from guard to the tower frequency about 25 to 30 miles out from the airport. I can always turn off COM2 if it's too chatty or distracting to what I need to do on COM1. Good. I then continue on IFR, sequence in with the tower, collect my cancellation cookies when conditions permit, and land. I realize this adds one more step to a heavy workload while preparing to land, but I find it useful and wanted to share. Thanks for all you do. Juliet Delta. That is a very good tip. Um, going into non-towered airports, that's also useful. You're still talking to approach. They haven't said you have the airport. You can start building that situational awareness several miles out. Uh, you know, 10 minutes of story time in the pattern lets you know there's a student pilot in there. There's a, uh, a, a, twin that's always overtaken a smaller one and now here comes you and your airplane minding your own business ifr and five miles isn't a lot of time to acclimate so right uh that is sort of advanced uh your results may vary on your ability to concentrate on that other frequency but it is a great way to do exactly what you said build situational awareness if it's too much turn it down turn it off and wait till you get closer. But you should be trying to build a picture before you get released to the wild by ATC. Mm. And in this case, to a tower that could be busy. There's a controller there, and they should be telling you what's important. Hey, you're number two. I'm putting a guy on a base in front of you. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. The other stuff may not be as important because there's a a controller working the working the problem, but. Very good. I love this feedback. Thank you, Juliet Delta. Yeah. We, so times where we would want to do this, and we were always, you know, two pilots, we would just split the radios up. Hey, you get, you get COM1. I'm going to get COM2. I'm turning off COM1. Mm-hmm. You know, the pilot flying would be with whoever they were being worked by, you know. Mm-hmm. So if you're talking to approach, the pilot flying's talking to approach. And the, Non-flying pilot would be monitoring tower. <clears throat> so if you have two pilots and you can divvy it up like that, it's super. It, it can be super helpful. Yep. Very good. All right. Um, let's see. We're doing. We're gonna run long. Uh, I'm okay. We with could that. move this. We could n- move number five to next week. Uh, if you want to spend more time on it. Um. Uh, or we could try. Or we could just go long. I'm okay. Either way. It's up to you. All right. You get number four. Number four. From SCAC patron Bravo Sierra. 
Fellas, it's been a while since you guys have had to pester the Terp self. <laughs> Maybe I'm not giving you guys enough credit, and you can figure this one out. Whilst, I love I that word. That. I don't. I can't say it. I'm okay. not going to try. Whilst on our family, on our annual family pilgrimage to the Forgotten Coast Airport, known for oysters, I was dealing with some marginal VFR weather at night. Uh, fortunately, I was able to get below the layer and conduct a visual approach to this airport, but during my pre-flight, I reviewed all of the available approaches and noticed something unusual with the notams that were issued for these approaches. This airport is an old Air Force base and has six runways, Ugh. and four of the runways have RNAV GPS approaches. The recently issued notams say straight-in approaches are not authorized at night and circling to any of the six runways are not authorized at night. Terrain is not an issue. It's on the shores of the coast. And there are a very small number of cell towers, <laughs> as evidenced by the terrible cell coverage in the area. So, no instrument night landings at this airport. Is that what someone is trying to tell us? I guess the root of my question is why? Thank you, Bravo Sierra. Um, this might be a terp self question. It might be. So, the ones that we've had on this topic, because we've had a couple, almost always ends up being some obstacle, maybe not uh, an antenna, a cell tower. It could be a tree. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm talking like something that's only 50 feet tall. But it goes into that f 40 to 1, I think. Mm -hmm. It goes into that 40 to 1... Uh, slope from the airport wherever that starts 35 feet at the departure end mm -hmm. something like that uh, I don't know exactly where that 40 to 1 starts but if anything is going into that for the approach that you're doing they're going to NA at it yep, they're going to mm -hmm. NA it at night Yep. and for all the approaches I think it's a result of the timing and um, perhaps somebody is responsible for reviewing these procedures and make sure there is nothing that goes into that plane, that safety plane of obstacle clearance, and it hasn't been done. Now, good news on this, an airport where, where we have friends of the show, supporters of the show, friends we've known for years, where their airport used to have NA at night, and now it went away. Somebody chopped a tree down or something. Yeah. So it's not lost forever, but you could reach out to that airport and find out like, hey, it, I don't know how easy that would be with the military, but somebody may know what specifically is causing that. If the Terp self knows, please tell us. Yeah. But something is preventing you from being able to safely navigate VFR, VMC, from the minimum descent altitude to the runway. Something is causing that to not be perceived as safe, and that's why it says N.A., so to avoid the inevitable emails we're going to get, uh, and someone is going to ask, what airport are we talking about? I'm just going to let okay. it be known. It's Alpha Alpha Foxtrot. Okay. So if anybody can look that up, I don't know, Terp Self or yeah. somebody can still has access to that Alpha Alpha Foxtrot. Otherwise, my guess is it is an obstacle penetrating the 40 to 1 mm -hmm. plane. Yep. All right, I have time. If you have time, we could do this. And I, I have time. All right, number five from Patron Charlie Hotel. Patron Charlie Hotel at the Bread and Roses Delta, just outside the Bean Town Bravo. I swear I heard a record scratch when I st when I stopped OB three fifteen and went back to re listen to RH make the following statement about pilots and stage two in our totally made up spectrum of <laughs> controllers and training. <laughs> Right. I have, quote, I said this, I have very strong feelings about this stage for pilots. It should be exactly where we stay and live and get comfortable. You shouldn't be experimenting with things. I get the point RH is making. Don't do stupid things that will kill you. That was what I was trying to say. Hopefully I can elaborate a little bit. What I think accidentally gets thrown out here is the concept that the private pilot certificate is a license to learn. And you're right, it is. I would argue that your statement for controllers, you have to take some risks that aren't unsafe. You have to push your boundaries. 
That's exactly how a pilot should grow from a newly minted private pilot into a good citizen of the NAS. I don't disagree with that. I I think my strength for keeping them in, in phase two, where something scared you or something presented itself uh, when you this was a control or somebody, something at the beginning scared you, you had a busy session or you got too close and you go into ultra conservative mode and you spend a lot of time there. I, I'm going to try to elaborate on this for the pilot. We are, and you're going to list some of the things that you wouldn't have done if you weren't afraid to get out of your comfort zone. And I encourage that go do new things, but you're not also, you're also not inventing new ways to fly an airplane. You're, you're, you should be doing things that have been demonstrated or that you've seen because you've got instruction on it, uh, that you can research. You're not going out and reinventing the wheel of aviation. Pilots should follow the rules and learn how to do something before they go embark on these big adventures. We'll get to that. Can I continue? Mm-hmm. Um, controllers have three miles of separation before planes touch. CFIs train pilots to build in margins for safety. We go from not being able to start the plane without an instructor to landing without assistance, getting signed off to go solo, then a local airport, a long cross-country solo. And finally, we get the FAA's blessing that we're safe enough to fly on our own. Further growth comes from exploring the edges of the personal minimums you adopted. Why are we limiting ourselves to long, paved runways only? How do I plan flights that require a fuel stop? responsibly shrinking those margins from overly conservative to more normal limits for an experienced pilot should be part of the process. I totally agree with that. Yeah. yeah it Some, has to be that. It, it does. It has to be that way. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. Sometimes those happen in stage one when we end up scaring the crap out of ourselves. I remember experiencing my first 10 knot wind shear on final and thankfully my instructor had drilled me on being ready for a go round. I had limits on overall wind, but I learned to include limiting the gust factor to be an important safety margin for me. Very good. Uh, Just like controllers in stage two, many pilots are ruled by their fears and and act more conservatively than they need to. They may never leave this stage, even though their logbook shows hundreds to thousands of hours. And here's some examples. I refuse to talk to ATC because I got yelled at once. It's a good example. Uh, I won't fly it into non-towered airports because they're full of reckless pilots. All right. I don't fly if the winds are more than five knots. You probably will never fly again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I won't get my instrument rating because I don't want to die in the clouds. Die flying in the clouds. These are actual things I've heard pilots say. At best, those pilots aren't taking full advantage of their privileges and at worst are making life more difficult for controllers and other pilots. I wasn't ready for that 10 knot change in wind, but now I feel much more comfortable with gusting winds because I practiced with a CFI. And that's what I'm trying to say. Right. You shouldn't be doing new things that you haven't at least learned the basics of. Right. When you're by yourself. That's. Yeah. You you probably shouldn't be teaching yourself, teaching yourself. Yes. New things. Learn it from somebody. Yeah. Which I think some controllers do have to do. You have to do because the scenario is different all the time. And that's the distinction that's hard to make in this. Yeah. You know, these levels of controllers have to do things different every day. The best controllers don't have a repeat the next day. Yeah. Everything's different. There's different customers, different winds, different weather challenges. There's something different. So I think it's incumbent on a controller to get out of two and go into three because they have to gain confidence. I think you're in two in, in these examples. I think you're really staying there. You're, you learn from your mistake and you got better and you get more comfortable, perhaps expanding your boundaries a little bit, but you're still being safe in, in doing so. Hmm. Um, where did I end here? We should strive to grow and expand into stage three pilot with experience gained from expanding our, our horizons. I don't disagree. I think it's just just a different way we're saying it. Uh, this is how pilots become full participants and good good citizens in the NAS. Without pushing my boundaries, I would have never flown the Hudson Corridor, taken a multi-day trip that involved weather planning, fuel stops, and a heaping pile of contingency plans just in case. 
I would have never flown to a 2,000 foot strip that was 35 feet wide. Have you ever done that? It feels like you're landing on a driveway. <laughs> Can't nearby. begin to describe the, thing, the tiny things that I've landed on. That's true. Not in an airplane, though. Right. No. Uh, practiced increasing levels of crosswind to build my skills. Asked for a shortcut across a quieter corner of a Bravo for the first time. Or kept up my night currency year-round through a purposeful practice. I love that. Uh, the finished pilots shouldn't be ruled by their fears. Pilots should learn, grow, and become the safest versions of themselves while experiencing as much of the system as they can. I still have boundaries that I want to push and keep expanding my skills towards mastery of flying patron trolley hotel. These are great. I think we're on the same page. And I actually reached I, out and we communicated back and forth on text about this. I, I know Charlie hotel. Uh, we've met in person. I agree a hundred percent. And if I came across as trying to say that a pilot should never expand their boundaries, I did not mean that. I think they should be cautious, careful to follow the rules that are there for a reason. And almost all those examples require some other training or you can, you you did learn those skills in in your private or your instrument training. You're just using them. Um, oh, what's a good way to sum that up? You shouldn't you shouldn't be teaching yourself. That's that's a great way you said it. Yeah, yeah. Something that you've never done. That's <laughs> a new skill that is out of your comfort zone. I think kind of that's what R is just trying to say. Like your comfort zone, I, I just know people, I know pilots that thought their comfort zone was way bigger than it should have been. And I think what he's trying to say is you need to kind of rein that back in a little bit. Like just because you have a license doesn't mean you go out and just do every – Right. Uh, every uh, – task that requires uh, a degree of skill that has to be developed and it should be developed with somebody that already has it mm -hmm. mountain flying is a good example if you've never great done that great example mountain flying is just chock full of surprises that you don't know that are there until you get taught about them and i yeah, encourage and, and the pilots to get that training and if you didn't get taught about them and you go and do it on your own, it could kill you. Mm -hmm. really, Aerobatics. Really fast, yes. Aerobatic training. Can you do that on an airplane that's certified to be aerobatic without instruction? Yeah. I don't think there's anything that's stopping you from doing it. Could you be risking your life? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's, it's hard to make this analogy to controlling. It really is. Because... I think there's a lot more gray with controlling. You could you could be safe, but terribly inefficient as a controller. Mm -hmm. You can be a safe pilot, or you could be the one that there's not a lot of stories. They don't make it that long, and I and that's what I'm trying to encourage. There should be steps taken to ensure that you stay safe and conservative. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean you have to only fly to ten thousand foot runways forever, but do it with systemic systematic is what i meant systematic learning and and research and and getting those skills from someone else in a lot of cases with an instructor that i encourage 100 percent. yeah i love this list of you know pushing my boundary without pushing my boundaries i never would have done those things i love that list that is a good list to have um but it I think it's within the confines of, you know, responsible growth, not yep. just wild. On my first, on my first flight as a private mm -hmm. pilot, I went and just went blasting into the Hudson corridor, you know, willy nilly, having no idea what you're doing. Didn't watch YouTube. Didn't read any of the information that's available right. out there. You didn't right. do that. You, you probably lived that flight in your head for hours yeah and you know hours of research to to see what you were going to do on that you did learn how to land on a 2000 foot service when you did short field landings and private training probably a lot less than that you're probably stopped and off the runway in 1500 feet yeah hey it's different when you're doing it in real life and there's trees at the end of the runway <laughs> um yeah i th i think i'm 
I love, I love the email. I agree with you hundred percent. Don't, don't stagnate, grow, but do it responsible, responsibly and, and educate yourself. Yep. Yep. Love it. That's a great way to end this one. We didn't go that far over. Not too bad. Uh, we have feedback prior to December 3rd, 2023, right on the show. I think so. I don't know. <clears throat> uh, there's a t- look. Let me just say this. Oh, love it. Go. I there's it. a ton of emails in there that are super, super long. Okay. I get it. You have, you know, you're trying to set up the story. You're trying to give the background. Um, but there needs to be a little bit of <laughs> consolidation because it is. Um, it is difficult for us to wade through all of that and try to respond mm-hmm. to all of the tidbits in there. I don't, we don't have time for it. Mm-mm. We don't have time. And I'm not trying to be mean about it. Um, but it's, and we get to them. We eventually get to them. We almost always get to those mm-hmm. things. It just is going to take a long time and it's going to take longer because what I tend to do is push those to the bottom mm-hmm. and I, t- I get the low-hanging fruit, a simple half a paragraph, this is the question, Mm -hmm. boom, and I respond to it. Um, Those really, really long ones, you know who you are. We can't put them on the show. It's just way too much. This one that we just read is about the max that I'm willing to do. It's almost a page. It's about a page long. That's about the max. Well, Um, thank you for putting it in there because – This was important. I I felt like this was important. I wanted um, a chance to respond to that. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't know what I'm trying to say. Just try to be as as brief as you can. Yeah, because we're been, just we're just two people, and like especially right now, RH is covered up. He's do, he is way too busy to be piddling around with the inbox that I'm trying to take care of right now. But I get busy, and then I get. It gets kind of discouraging when you go in there and it's like, oh, my gosh, I've got to spend. I mean, I could easily spend an hour reading mm-hmm. through through the emails, just reading them, not responding. Right. So that's why it's going slow, because I'm getting bogged down. I'm so getting- I'll defend you on this. We've we've done our best. And that's what timely feedback came into the picture, probably at episode 100 or so. I don't remember. Um, or we tried to keep some relevance for what we just talked about. And we've always gone from, you know, the oldest to an up in our inbox. And we try not to forget anybody. So it's a good thing that there's a lot in there. That's a great problem to have. Uh, but yep. just be patient for the ones that think that we're never going to get back to them. We, we will eventually get back to you. It's just the longer it is, the less likely it's going to end up on the show because it takes away our ability to answer other questions on the show because we've stayed in that commitment to, to dates and times. Right. So you're crushing the notes, by the way. They're great. Look, I don't want to discourage people from sending in feedback. We need Mm -hmm. it. That's what's driving the train here. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just telling you, if you want it to be on the show, there's a couple things that really help brevity, have it like not, not a half a page, maybe somewhere right in there, a couple paragraphs. Mm hmm. Um, and be a patron. That's going to help you a ton. I, mm-hmm. It's not that we don't include non-patron um, feedback, but when we have enough patron feedback, that's what's going to be in there. That patrons are going to take priority over non-patrons. Um, I think in the last since I've been doing the show notes, we've had maybe two or three non-patron feedbacks. Mm-hmm. Everything. And it's not because is, it's not important. It's just. We're, right. We have to prioritize. Right. We can only fit so many in, and the folks that support the show are going to take priority. Um, and, but we still get to you. We still get back to you. Mm-hmm. It's just going to take a while. It just takes a while. So just be patient. Thank you for for sending stuff in. Yeah, that's what makes the show. All right. Anything else? Nope. Closing out episode 316 of Opposing Bases, Air Traffic Talk, Romeo Hotel. And Alpha Golf. Goodbye, everyone. 
Visit OpposingBases.com where you can send a written or audio question to be included on a show. Find AG and RH on Instagram at Opposing Bases. Send your questions to feedback at OpposingBases.com. For access to live stream video recordings, bonus audio, early recordings, and discounts on show merchandise, visit patreon.com slash opposing bases to join an awesome aviation community. The views and opinions expressed on Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk are for entertainment purposes only and do not represent the views, opinions, or official positions of the FAA, Penguin Airlines, or the United States Army. Episodes shall not be recorded or transcribed without express written consent. For official guidance on laws, rules, and regulations, consult an aviation attorney or a certified flight instructor. Drop.